This is a Piccolo podcast production. Previously on Adam Shand at Large. We're trying something different here. We're going to pick up on some stories that I really think should be told. Some of them don't have endings. Some of them haven't got middles. I want to be able to bring those stories where we can make a difference, find a resolution, get some justice for a a missing loved one. It's like when I started in journalism, a little tape recorder with me, and I was told to go out and get stories, talk to people. He's still my dad. And because he was never found and things were never investigated, um, I was unable to take any proceedings whatsoever about what had happened to me as a child. It's fantastic chatting to Christine and I hope something comes of her story. And, you know, our purpose here is not to make allegations, it's to really erase what the police have done and what still needs to be done. That is a mystery that needs to be solved. Welcome to another episode of Adam Shand at Large. And thanks for all the feedback on episode one. Much appreciated. Today, we have another loved one who has never recovered. Three-year-old Cheryl Grimmer was with her family on Ferry Meadow Beach near Wollongong on the 12th of January, 1970. She was there with her mother, Carol, and three brothers. A typical carefree summer day. At about 1.30pm, the weather had changed and it was time to go home a migrant hostel across the road from the beach. Carol told the kids to wash the salt and sand off at the shower block. Seven-year-old brother Ricky was in charge. He left her alone for just a few minutes, and a predator who was watching took his opportunity. Cheryl Grimmer disappeared without a trace. There was a ransom demand that came to nothing, and a thousand leads that went nowhere. A year later... A troubled teenager confessed to Cheryl's murder, but when he got a few details wrong, police concluded he was making it up and let him go. We can't name him for legal reasons, so he's been given the alias Mercury. In 2016, two detectives unearthed Mercury's confession and charged him with murder, but before he could go on trial, a judge found his 1971 confession was inadmissible because an adult had not been present. You can find my interview with those cops on my Australian Detectives podcast on Listener. It was a perfect investigation that should have resulted in a self-confessed killer behind bars. But still, Mercury walks the streets. This has left the Grimmer family in a never-ending limbo, still seeking justice for Cheryl. Brother Ricky leads the charge. I have never seen anyone fight so tenaciously for a result than this man. Those few moments on Ferry Meadow Beach resonate in Ricky's mind every single day. He will never give up, and Ricky is my guest today. G'day, Ricky. G'day, Adam. How are you doing? Very well, mate. Thank you. It, all these years later, it's like it's yesterday for you, isn't it, really? 53 years, still yesterday to me. Tell us about that day. Ah, well, earlier on that, that day, I was uh, we lived at the Ferry Meadow Hostel. We had the old huts there and made corrugated iron. They were very, very hot. It was a hot day, uh, middle of summer um, in Wollongong. And I pleaded with my mother that m- morning to uh, take us all down the beach. She relented and, um, you know, packed us up and um, off we went down to the beach to en- enjoy a beautiful day down the beach playing around as kids did back those days and, you know, building sand castles, running along the waterfront, enjoying the day. It was a beautiful day. Early on in that afternoon, the, the winds picked up um, and my mum asked me to take all of the siblings up to the shower block to rinse off the sand to walk back to the hostel. So I had um, Cheryl, Stephen and Paul with me, who I was responsible for all of them. Took them up uh, to the shower block. Shower, uh, Cheryl followed us into the um, male's shower block. Came out. Um, she was a uh, she was thirsty, and I could see her wanting to try and get a drink. So I lifted her up to the water tap, fountain, bubbler, whatever you want to call it, and uh, gave her a drink. Um, then she ran into the ladies' changing room, which was right next door, and um, she wouldn't come out. I tried to, um, you know, coax her out, even saying, look, mum will get mad with you. If you if you don't come out, we need to get, get going, blah, blah, blah. But she was, as a three-year-old, was doing just being naughty, enjoying the day, still having fun, you know, playing around with her big brother. 
my mistake was leaving her inside the female toilet and going to get my mother. How old were you at the time? Um, eight. Just eight. And you're still blaming yourself to this day? I don't purposely blame myself, but I, I shouldn't have left that day. I should have sent one of my brothers. I should have sent, because they, they were playing 80 metres from me and my two brothers. I should have um, I should have sent one of them. Do you remember the aftermath of that day? On, on that day, police and so forth? What are your memories? Well, memories were um, going down to get my mother, um, and it was a little bit strange that she was still packing up, so she was taking her time and getting up to us at the shower block, and uh, I said to her, I said, look, I'm sure I won't, won't come out of the female to toilet block yet. You better come up, or words to that effect. And um, we finished packing up. I helped my mum finish packing up, and we walked slowly up to the shower block uh, to grab Cheryl and, and Stephen and Paul. Um, Stephen and Paul had followed us back down, but they were still running backwards and forwards. And um, when we got up there, my mother went into the female um, shower block and Cheryl wasn't there. She came over and asked me, you know, where where is she? I said, look, she was just inside the doorway there. She walked around a couple of times shouting out her name and... Um, then she came up and shook me again and said, look, you know, where is she, blah, blah, blah. I said, I don't know. I said, that's where she was. And then I, it was probably only within five to six minutes that her screaming, her shouts got louder for her. We went back down to the beach to check that she hadn't gone down to the beach. That's when I saw the panic start setting in on my mother's face. Um, we went back to the hostel to see if she'd gone, you know, walked up to the main road. Mum was getting into a bit of a panic because that road was quite busy just in front of the hostel. And that's what I remember of the day. And then we were sort of packed up and taken back to the, the hostel later that afternoon. Because you've always felt that you were responsible for your siblings. Why did you feel that? Back then, the, the eldest, I think, in most families were, were responsible for their siblings to look after them. If your mother sort of gave you a task or a chore to do, it was your responsibility to make sure that, you know, they were safe. You know, that's what I believe anyway. I think um, a lot of families acted. The, the eldest sibling had a lot of responsibilities back in those days. It's a difficult question. But with your parents, how did that affect your relationship with them? With my mother, it, 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 it actually she became more protective of me after after that day, and she probably had her own reasons, and I never asked her those reasons. Um, my who I thought was my father at the time, it became pretty volatile to the point, you know, there was beatings and stuff like that, and. Unfortunately, when alcohol was involved from his side of the fence, um, you know, the blame game would come out and, and stuff like that. And it wasn't until I was 13 that I, um, I was, that my, my parents were having an argument not long before we went back to the UK. They were having an argument at a, a unit that we lived in in Penrith. And um, I actually agreed with my father, who I thought was my my biological father, um, I said, look, mum, you need to back down. Dad's right. And the next thing he says, there you go, he's not even my son. And I was just horrified. I went, And I knew something was right because this knife that my mother had flung just missed me. Um, it was intended for him, of course, um, but uh, he yeah, missed us both. And I said, look, is there something you need to tell me? And they said, yes, um, Vince isn't your biological father. Because this is the story within the story, yeah. isn't it? Like your, yeah. your personal journey through with identity and forgiveness and the family drama that ensued, it's it's quite epic, really. So what did you learn about your actual origins? Well, you know, I've done this stupid teenager thing, run away for a few days, come back cold, wet and hungry. And I asked my mother, and she didn't really want to say too much. She said, look, you know, um, your, your father, when you were born, wanted nothing to do with you. He was a bit volatile, a bit abusive, uh, my biological father, apparently. And um, I really didn't ask too many questions. It wasn't until years later 
that I started getting curious, obviously, um, who my biological father was, um, the relationship between my stepfather now, who, who was, it was out of control. We were sort of abusive to one another. Did he blame you? Did, did he blame you for what happened to Cheryl? He had his moments, I think he, you know, and as you, you, you go venting, I've got um, I've got four kids and I don't know how I would vent if one, if something happened to one of them, you know, um, and I had no answers. I understand that they've gone now 25, 20 years, 25 years with no answers, nothing. Um, so for him, when he had his moments of weaknesses, we'll call it, and um, he, he tended to take it out on, on, on me. And even, you know, his own two boys um, from time to time copped a little bit as well. So, you know, it's his way of venting and stuff. And unfortunately, that was that was on me. And to make matters worse, the investigation goes completely cold over decades. You hear nothing. Very little comes forward. So over the years, what did the family believe had happened to Cheryl? What There was a few leads at the time. There was a, a so-called Mediterranean man who was there, who was maybe seen with Cheryl or other different reports. What did your family believe had happened to her and who was the culprit? I don't think they ever really knew. They always lived with the hope that um, Cheryl was taken by somebody. They always thought that the best of a an awful situation that somebody had been, Cheryl had taken, been taken by somebody that couldn't have a child um, and was being brought up in hopefully a good environment. And one day she would come knocking on the door. Police, I don't think they had much contact with police over the years. Initially, obviously they did in the first couple of years, maybe first 12 months. But after that, they seemed to have very little contact with police. I remember many, many years ago that Ray Martin done a special show with them, um, a one hour lunchtime special with them. And that was the first time as a teenager that I'd seen my mother and father on, on television speaking about Cheryl. Other than that, the family really didn't speak about it. Um, it was my father's wishes not to talk. He just obviously live with the hope that one day she, she was going to walk back in into their lives and our our lives so yeah and meanwhile there was so much unresolved stuff with you that guilt the dramas with your father discovering that he wasn't your father no one ever took you aside i don't think and said ricky this is not your fault you grew up with that firmly in your mind that you're responsible for the loss of your sister but to be fair, when you say that no one took me aside, that's because I buried it. You know, um, I never explained my feelings uh, about what I was thinking, what was going through my head. It was just buried. It was locked inside. And I just dealt with it as I grew up through different avenues, eventually finding alcohol and being a bit wild and, and, and doing the crazy things in life that you do in your 20s and 30s and 40s and so on. Or 50s. And 50s, <laughs> and, and now 60s. Um, I'm the same, so I, I, I relate to that. So no one could really help me because I wasn't screaming out for help. It was it was well disguised, well hidden. Um, unfortunately, people came in and out of my life, and I probably made their life hell because I was just a, I was a mess. I was a basket case. You're talking about wives and girlfriends? Wives, girlfriends, yeah. Yep. Yeah, um, and now four kids. I was blessed to have four kids and four grandkids. So, yeah. You can give them all a blanket apology now if you like, or we can do it individually later on. I'd like to catch up with them all one day and, and apologize for, for my actions because it's, it's no excuse. It's just, um, you know, I've met some beautiful people along the way and I've destroyed um, some relationships, uh, especially my, my third wife that uh, enjoyed my. Yeah, enjoyed me for 21 years basically, and um, she was um, she gave me three beautiful kids, um, two boys, and um, and a daughter. In fact, we we're talking before we began the interview about your very successful career. You, you you built a very good life. You've got four kids who are who are successful in their own right, grandchildren there. You've got a lot of the components for a happy life, but I guess men, we do this. You know, we we snatch defeat from the jaws of victory um, as men. 
But I think all over that time, you're having to accommodate this reality about Cheryl, that there will be no resolution, that there will be no answer. But then everything changes. How did that happen? I got a call late in 2016 from a detective um, in Wollongong, Damien Loon, um, who asked me my name, first of all. I said, well, you've rung me so you know who you're speaking to. And he goes, can you tell me who you are? And I told him. And um, he said, I'm, I'm working on your, on your sister's case. Um, and we believe there's a, a arrest that will be imminent. Um, we have a suspect in the murder of your sister. And I remember saying him words to the effect of, what the fuck are you on about, mate? Because that was the first time, apologies for the swearing there, that was the first time that I'd ever heard the word murder. Didn't want to hear it. Wanted to believe that she was going to knock on my door one day. Um, because it was only a, a few years before that that um, somebody did knock on the door one day saying, well, basically contacted my brother and said, look, I'm, I'm your sister. Um, so I flew up to Brisbane to meet this young lady um, who thought she was Cheryl um, with lots of wow, could this be the day, you know, could this be the day that she's going to walk back into all of our lives, not just mine, all of our lives, you know. Unfortunately, my mum had passed and my, my father had passed, my stepfather had passed. So flew up to Brisbane. My brothers told me I was nuts and said, look, don't do this. She's not, yes, she's not, blah, blah, blah. But I, I couldn't take no for an answer. I had to find out myself. And, and she wasn't, unfortunately. She truly believed that she was. Um, but speaking with police who said um, they she had uh, approached them as well, um, she wasn't, no. That's a very <clears throat> difficult thing to deal with. And I guess that's one of the problems with these long-term cases is there are the imposters, the fakers, the hoaxes that, that come along and and they do do a tremendous amount of damage. Fortunately, with Damien Loon and his partner, Frank San Vitale, you had some very serious investigators who looked at it strongly. And they laid out a scenario which must have been you must have been thunderstruck. So what did – you can actually find their, their investigation on my uh, – on the listener podcast, Australian Detectives, under the Ferry Meadow tag. You can see the whole – listen to the whole investigation there. But what did uh, Frank and Damo come to you with? Oh, that they had a person of interest. Um, they wouldn't tell me too much that they, they truly believed they were on the, on the right track. They wanted to speak to me. Um, they wanted to hold an interview at Ferry Meadow Beach uh, with myself and my brothers to, to talk about the new leads that they'd come across. They didn't tell us what type of leads that they had, but they were strong leads. And um, they truly believed that once they locate this person, there would be an arrest, unbeknownst to us at the time, um, that this person confessed all the way back in 1971. It wasn't until the first court hearing that we found out about this confession that he gave in 1971, which horrified us all, obviously. Especially now he's charged with the abduction and murder of, of Cheryl. Um, because the police chose not to tell you all those years. They had a, they had a suspect, they had a, an extensive investigation, and nothing was related to the family. How did that feel after all those years? Well... Obviously, they never even told my parents back in 1971 about the confession because it was never spoken about, never. We'd never heard about this confession. Um, the two detectives, um, that Damien and Frank, that were working on the case didn't know about the confession. They found it as they were going through the archives. Um, I believe the confession was mentioned very, very briefly in 2011 at the um, inquest of Cheryl's um, disappearance, and now we know murder. And that was 40 years after her disappearance. Um, you know that now the confession is it pops up and it's sort of um, gone over very fast. You know, it sort of moved, saying that they couldn't find the author of this confession. They tried for months and months and months, but no success. But we know today, I don't believe that to be true. They just completely dropped the ball back in the day by the sounds. Yes, I believe so. I believe so. If, if what we heard at the very first hearing from the first 
Crown Prosecutor that um, dragged myself and my brother, well, not dragged us, but took us into a private room. Um, his words were along the lines that we will get a guilty verdict in this case. We will. But to get that guilty verdict, we're going to have to hear about all the mistakes that have been made throughout the years. We haven't got to hear those mistakes. And you were faced with an old investigation, and that, that's what Damien and Frank had to work with, an old investigation that they had a troubled youth who had been uh, in and out of juvenile detention and so forth. He had psychiatric issues. He, he made some wild statements in addition to this very detailed, confession about seeing Cheryl on the beach, seeing the family, seeing her take a drink at the bubbler, as you said earlier. And it looked to the untrained eye like a slam dunk, lay down mazer, whatever you want to call it. And I think Damien and Frank were very confident, as was the prosecutor, that, that this would be enough to convict him. What happened? Well, none of what was in his confession was ever released to the media. No one knew. Only the person that was there on the day that gave such a detailed confession would know all of those things. He had to be there. He had. And when you say he's made these wild accusations and stuff like that, is he just a very cold and calculated person? Is he manipulative? Um, is he smarter than what we're giving him credit for? I truly believe it's the case. He hides in plain sight. Because when you read that confession, and as I say, you can, you can find the, the full text of this in my interview with, with Damien and Frank on Listen to Australian Detectives, but you see someone there who describes the stalking, abduction, and murder of a three-year-old child. Either he's got the greatest imagination in the world or he's read a book or he is a prototype sex offender waiting to happen, whether it's at this moment or later. And the fact that he was allowed to slip through the cracks, as it were, to be to, for his confession to be dismissed as a hysterical, made-up hoax, when it was so detailed. Police described him possibly as an attention seeker. Okay, maybe if that was the case. If you're an attention seeker and you confess to a murder, abduction, that's one thing. But in his confession, he details why he took Cheryl. Now he didn't have, you know, if you were just looking for attention, you wouldn't put that bit in. He took her to have sex with her, a three-year-old little girl, and he wants to have sex with her. What sick person are you that you want to take a three-year-old girl to have sex? She had more courage than a lot of people that have worked on Cheryl's case. She fought back. She screamed. And that's why he murdered her, because she fought back. She had more courage than him, than anybody. The remarkable thing about that investigation is, and that confession is he never withdrew it. He never came back and said, listen, I made all that up. It was the police that decided he had. During his... Um, interview in 2017, he adopts the statement freely in a record of interview, taped record of interview. Frank and Damien Lynn take, take him through each question. Yes, I said that. Yes, yes, yes. It wasn't until the end of the statement, he says, no, I was never there, that they knew that they had their man. That was his first lie, his very, very first lie. I truly believe also that he is responsible for the ransom note that was received at Bulleye Police Station only days after um, Cheryl went missing. And the reason why I say that is a couple of things. Let's just go through the text of that ransom note for, for the listeners. Yeah, th it was um, that um, I'd taken your sister... Um, Oh, or taken Cheryl. Um, they wanted he wanted ten thousand uh, dollars ransom. Um, it was to be delivered at a certain location um, out near Bulleye, um, and other details in there. Um, and that was only three days after, three or four days after Cheryl had, had gone missing. Had this ransom note been delivered to Bulleye Police Station? In his confession, 
he happens to mention that he left Cheryl at the bottom of Bulleye. There's the first coincidence. That's Bulleye that's Bull Pass there at Wollongong. Bulleye Pass in Wollongong, yes. So was he already playing games? Unfortunately, police made a bit of a, a mockery of the whole situation where they advertised the ransom note uh, on national television. Um, so it turned into a bit of a circus on that day where there were thousands of people and... It was a lot of a circus. <laughs> Uh, you just got to go back through the archives. Frank Sambatali and Damien Moon were convinced they had their man. Two very, very experienced detectives. Damien was, in fact, the, 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 uh, the first um, um, detective to work the Lynn Dawson case, which became the Teacher's Pet podcast, which has become a huge thing. And he's a, he's a terrific detective, as is Frank. But they were convinced that Mercury was the man. And they felt that everything had been done according to Hoyle. But then there's a voir dire which is the, the proceeding before the, the case, as it were. Yeah. What happened at that voir dire? Well, the, the judge said he had no, no options here but to release him based on that there was, he believed, no um, adult supervision, uh, no representative on behalf of Mercury in the room the day he was interviewed. Uh, now, I really, really struggle with that as well. Um, the One of the detention centre representatives, um, I'm not sure what his position was, but a Mr Lecky contacted police saying that he had a um, somebody in the, in the detention centre that was saying he had some information about Cheryl Grimmer. And he felt so strongly about it that he felt that police should come straight away and sort of chat to this young fella. Uh, about the information that he had. So um, apparently two detectives, being Detective Finlay and Detective Parrington, went to see him in his home, not in a police station, in the home where he resided at the time being a detention home. They start to talk to him about it um, and quickly realise he's confessing to taking care of They stop. They give him all of his rights and stuff like that. The conversation continues on and he gives a full confession. So the police have been invited to go to the home. Isn't that enough to say, isn't that permission to come and interview somebody that you're looking after? If they were really concerned about his health, and who else was in that room that day? Was Lecky sitting in that room? Why haven't we gone back to get all of the records at the detention centre? There must be notes. Police don't just walk into a detention centre and start questioning somebody. Sure. According to the law of the day, this was all done according to Hoyle, just perfect. Yep. So there was no issue. It was only this retrospective law is what gets me. I think that must be the most frustrating aspect that somehow that what happened on a certain day can become something else with the application of a retrospective law. I think to anyone listening, that's, that's just madness. How can a law be written that's potentially protecting child murderers? What about protecting a three-year-old? And also the fact that he's not a child now. He did this allegedly when he was a child. He's a fully aware, mature adult now who I think if any common sense, if any you know, plain speak was applied to this, people would say, deny it. Come into court, deny it. If you didn't do it, why do you hide behind a procedural loophole, a side door, when you should just be telling us why you didn't do it? It's not once since um, his second, um, since he was arrested in 2017, is not once, and he's had plenty of opportunities to say, I didn't do it, I made it up. He's never denied not doing what he said in his confession, never once. I challenge him to come out and tell us that he didn't do it. Come and give me renewed hope that you were just, you just made it up. Give me renewed hope that Cheryl, let me be greedy, give me renewed hope that she's still alive. Okay, he's now free. We can't prosecute that side of the case anymore. What's that done? I mean, I guess it must have built up incredible hopes in you that, that there was going to be a resolution to this case after all these years. That disappointment, I can only imagine what you went through. Yeah, it was shock. I mean, 
shock for us all, Damien, Frank, um, all of our family here in Australia and and in the UK. I mean, we were told he's the person. We were told by the police. To this day, we still get told by police they know he's done it. And, you know, when I interviewed uh, Frank and Damien, and there's Frank, who's just a beautiful, big, lovable, delightful, determined character, I've never heard a policeman sob the way he did in that interview when we caught up with, you know, with the list of the three detectives. And I'd urge you to listen to that uh, because you could see the passion. He'd work with you, he'd work with your brothers. And to get to this point just was shocking. Well, Frank's become part of our family now. I mean, he's um, he's really struggling with how it's been handled um, since, since uh, Mercury's release back in 2019. And it seems like everybody's just given up um because of this retrospective law they've got a confession still sitting in archives again now uh and they know he's done it but they struggle now unless somebody comes forward with fresh evidence and i believe somebody here in victoria knows something i believe people that, are, that know who mercury is know something i believe if we dig deep enough we'll get the answers if um we have a look what's a have a look at the ransom note. Have a have a look at um, the confession again. Go back to the ransom note and confession. Can one and one equal two? There's a high possibility there. Look at the records at the detention home. I urge police to 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 get up there and have a look what's in there, just in case someone was in that room, was a representative, was his guardian on the day. Then we go back to court. Then we go back to court. It's that simple. It's that simple. Yeah. It's that simple. Yeah, you're right. And um, I think you're currently back in a kind of limbo because without a deep dive, continue to investigate this case, you can't prove that Mercury did it beyond reasonable doubt and you can't start to investigate anybody else. So you're stuck in that limbo where there has to be more work on this case, has to be either to prove beyond as you say, find other documents which attest to the fact that there were people on the scene there at the home when he was interviewed. And I'm, I'm not convinced there were, <clears throat> talking to Damien, he said that there were eight boxes of evidence that he went through. That wasn't eight of eight, it was just eight boxes. So is it possible, this has happened before occasionally, where more than occasionally, where evidence goes missing and it's not kept properly and but it can be found. So without extra work, you stay in the kind of limbo, which I think would almost be worse than where you were before, is it? It's evil because we know the answers are there. As I've said in, in multiple interviews that I've done, um, I truly believe the answers are right in front of us. We've just got to find a way to have them heard in a court of law. Mercury will continue to hide behind this retrospective law. I, I urge police to, to not, don't give up on Cheryl, you know, she, she, her voice needs to be heard in, in court. Um, we need the answers. It's it's not going to, even if he served the rest of his life in jail, it's, Cheryl's never coming back to us. But what we would like to 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 know is get some resolution um, from this. This is madness. How can this happen? How would you feel as a parent if this was happening to you? I have no idea. I'm not even going to try to put myself in your shoes. But what I have been impressed about with you, Ricky Nash, is that notwithstanding that crushing disappointment, since that time you've continued to fight, but also you've continued to try to put your life back together again, to repair your relationships, to, to forgive those, and maybe eventually even forgive yourself for some of these things. You know, it's easy to say you're doing it for Cheryl, but I think you're also doing it for wholeness for yourself. I've got a pretty strong woman in my life now that pushes me pretty hard as well and um, she doesn't take any of my crap anymore. So I, um, I, I truly believe it's Cheryl that's the one that's the strength in me. She's pushing me. She wants, she wants the answers why she was taken away from us. Um, even if they're 50-odd years late, people say better late than never. Um, he needs to be held accountable and, as I say, if he spends the next whatever years he's got in his life left, I believe he's uh, approaching 70 years of age now, it's never going to be enough, never going to be enough.
but it's something. Because I think there's, there's really something about this angst and the, the limbo of not having some, someone to bury at the end of the day. And that rings true in every culture, that it, it is very difficult to put someone to rest without their remains. So I know if, if it was me, what I'd like to ask Mercury would be, where did you put it? Well, we believe we know where he left Cheryl on, on, on the day. Unfortunately, back at those times, it was a, a you know, bottom of a, a mountain where there was wild animals and stuff like that. And we don't want to take our minds to what could have happened to Cheryl, um, you know, days after um, he had murdered her. Um, we've heard certain things from certain people at the time of, you know, crows hovering around at the time and stuff, but we don't want to take our, our minds there. We will probably never ever find Cheryl's remains. The most we can hope for is, is answers of, of why he done it, why. Courtesy of Wollongong City Council, um, we do have a place that we can go and, and remember the good times that we shared and um, very short three years with Cheryl, you know, they um, erected a, uh, a plaque um, at the beach, at Perimeadow Beach, which I quite often go to, and especially on birthdays and the anniversary of her disappearance and various times throughout the year. So we do have somewhere to go and just sort of sit down and relax and have a bit of a chat with Cheryl. So I think that's the most we can hope for now. I, I doubt very much that we'll ever find her remains. That unfortunately is probably the most likely outcome, but <clears throat> let me say, I just really admire your drive, your determination, and I'm going to help backing you by doing whatever I can in whatever limited capacity journos have. And I think you've had a lot of journos who felt the same way. John Kay of the BBC has done that wonderful podcast, Fairy Matter. Check that out as well, listeners. It's terrific. But I think from here on in is the most important part of the game where that, that this is not the end. And the problem with a lot of media is they end up stopping. What do they do next? What's the next episode? How do we excite our listeners or readers for the next thing? But this is not entertainment for you. This is your life. So I'm going to keep doing what I can, buddy, um, however small it is, and try to nudge people in the right direction. But also, if there's anybody out there who has just some recollection, anything of being on the beach that day at Ferry Meadow, talk to somebody. Or indeed, you may have known Mercury while living in Victoria. We've already we've already found people who, who who do know him and have given us some sort of in, you know, insight into what he was like. But somebody out there knows if he's confessed once, he's confessed again. That's the way these guys operate. Ricky Nash, thank you so much for coming on Adam Shad at Large. It's my absolute pleasure, and we'll keep going until there's a result. Thank you, Adam. That was Ricky Nash, brother of missing toddler Cheryl Grimmer. I know that New South Wales police are currently reviewing this matter in the hope they can still close the case. That could never come fast enough for Ricky Nash. If you can help or know someone that can, please get in touch with Crime Stoppers on 1800 333 000 or your local police station. In our next episode, what I did on my holidays in Zimbabwe or Aliens Over Africa. It's shiny, it's silver, it's got light. You you can't miss it. It's literally glowing, you know, in, in terms of shiny silver, right? So I, I turned around to look at the crowd around me, the kids around me. And, you know, you, you're just seeing kids talking and marveling and, and all of that. And then I looked back because this little, dare I say, man <laughs> appeared on top of this spacecraft. That's next when we speak. Thanks for being a part of Adam Shand at Large. 